Michael Murphy and I direct the Hank Center here at Loyola and Catholic Studies and do some teaching as well. And on behalf of uh, Dean Brian Schmiesek, uh, who's the Dean of uh, IPS, uh, we'd like to welcome you here. And I also want to welcome you on behalf of our staff, uh, the CCH staff, Gat and Scabby and Emily Kate are here right now, but we also have uh, Amy's coming and um, we have Joe and, and who am I forgetting? Megan, um, who help us with all of these things and without them, there's really not gonna be any events. So uh, I wanna thank them and welcome you here today. Um, before I turn things over to Therese who's gonna moderate our uh, event and also our, our, esteem, our esteemed panel, I'm so grateful you're here safely coming through snow and whatnot, uh, nor'easter. Um, I want to just turn our attention to some events coming up in the Hank Center. Uh, a lot going on in the next month here. Really had a very active spring, and Father Jim Martin and the Jesuitical uh, team will be podcasting from Loyola in front of a live studio audience on Friday at 2:30. Students welcome to that event. He's also speaking at one o'clock in Madonna del Strada Chapel on his recent book. And also at CTU on Saturday, 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 at seven. Saturday at seven. Saturday at seven. So there's there's lots of chances to see Father Martin as he's in town, and please take advantage of them. Um, also, we'll be marking the fifth anniversary of Pope Francis's pontificate on April fifth at seven o'clock in the evening with Dr. Massimo Fagioli of Villanova University, and Massimo will be providing the keynote uh, about just some reflections about. Uh, Pope Francis pontificate and he'll have a response from Dr. Miguel Diaz of Loyola and Dr. Melanie Barrett from Mundelein Seminary and the University of St. Mary of the Lake. So please join us for that if you're able to April 5th and then we have our Catholic Studies community is hosting the very popular and groundbreaking John Courtney Murray Forum on April 10th. It's our fifth one and it's called this year Seeking the Whole and that really is Catholicism quite literally. <laughs> um, uh, then we will have also the Hank Center welcoming our friends from Catholic University at Leuven uh, who are coming across the ocean to be with us and some friends from Notre Dame and from Northwestern in a conference called Catholic Conversion Narratives in Modernist Aesthetics. This is at Regents Hall upstairs on April 16th and 17th. So uh, hope to see you there. And finally, uh, the Hank Center and Commonweal Magazine welcome Bishop Robert McElroy, who will be delivering our second annual Cardinal Bernadine Common Cause Lecture. Uh, Bishop McElroy is giving a talk he's calling Forming a Catholic Political Imagination in a Time of Cultural Crisis. Won't want to miss that. These are exciting events all, and we hope to see you at any or all of them. Flyers are available, I think, everywhere you're looking, so uh, they can be kind of a memento for you. And uh, I really can't wait for our McElroy event, as much as I love everything else, as I love politics, and he is the most astute observer of our current moment, especially as it relates to Catholic social and intellectual tradition. So, speaking of politics, welcome again to the legacy of Humana Vitae and what it means to be pro-life. Uh, you know, this is the first in our 1968 series. Uh, there's a lot of this going around in America, marking uh, 50 years since that convulsive uh, year, really a, a liminal space almost that year was. If you think about it, and I was a rather young lad just out of the womb, quite honestly, at that time, uh, I just was remembering 15,000 Latinos left uh, LA schools protesting the state of education in 1968. The Tet Offensive, 1968. Martin Luther King and Robert F. Kennedy, April 4th and June, who remembers June what for Robert F. 6th? April 4th and June 6th, assassinations of major um, figures in American life. Uh, the Olympics and the protest, uh, black power and uh, protesting on the grounds of human dignity in front of the world stage. The convention in Chicago, Prague, the year of the student in Europe. All of these have a human concern and all of these have a kind of a Catholic concern. As we note that, that year, a lot of the kind of polarization we see today finds its genesis in how people handled as people of faith, as Catholics in this uh, focus, how they handled those, those convulsions. So we're looking at 
this is number one, uh, the legacy of Humana Vitae, and in the fall we'll have a two-day conference on other aspects, some of them I mentioned by name. So I'm gonna leave it to Therese to really uh, introduce what the panel is going to be um, hoping to do today. And so I'll, I'll do that right now by simply welcoming my friend and colleague, Therese Lausout, who's um, Professor of Ethics and Healthcare. I always forget how you, that's, ver health, eth eth oh, yeah, lots of, you're, you're a multiple hat wearer, Therese. And a, really a lot of fun to be with um, uh, in general, a really great thinker and a, and a, and a really great uh, just energy and personality. Appreciate your saying yes to moderating this, right? So Teresa will come up here and she'll explain what's gonna be happening. And welcome to Loyola and good to see you. Let me add my welcome. Uh, it's good to see a robust crowd here. Um, with a nice age distribution. So I think we'll have a nice discussion. Um, I was very pleased when uh, Mike Murphy uh, invited me to moderate this afternoon's panel rather than be a presenter. Uh, because I am not interested in that particularly challenging task, I am going to leave that to our three nationally recognized panelists uh, that we are indeed fortunate to have with us today because of this timely spring blizzard. Um, I'm going to introduce them each in the order that they will present, uh, uh, and then talk a little bit about how we're going to go through this, uh, and then I will turn it over to them. Uh, we begin with um, Dr. Julie Hanlon Rubio. Uh, I am delighted that she is here. She um, did me the great honor of contributing a chapter to my first book on Catholic moral theology. Um, so it's good to see her here today. She is a professor of Christian ethics and a professor of women and gender studies in the Department of Theology at St. Louis University. Uh, her teaching and research focuses on marriage, family, sex, and gender, uh, but she brings to this the perspective of a lay woman, Catholic, moral theologian, which is a really small group of people. Um, I recommend her books. Um, students have said to me, um, in various places. Her book transformed my life. Uh, and she has many of them. Uh, they include A Christian Theology of Marriage and Family, uh, Family Ethics, colon, Practices of Christians, uh, and her most recent book, Hope for Common Ground, Mediating the Personal and Political in a Divided Church, uh, where she attempts to move Catholics beyond culture war divisions to dialogue on contentious issues. Um, and I think we're going to be hearing more about this particular focus of hers in today's remarks. Uh, I am equally delighted to be joined by my good friend, Charlie Camosi. There's a Camosi. Camosi, sorry about that. People do that to my name, too. Uh, Dr. Camosi is an associate professor um, in the Department of Theology at Fordham University. Uh, you see this Jesuit theme emerging. Uh, a hallmark of his work is what he uh, calls fostering intellectual solidarity, uh, an attempt to walk with those of vastly different viewpoints in order to build bridges and, like Dr. Rubio, find common ground. You will see that in many of his works, including his founding and directing the Catholic Conversation Project, uh, his work with the International Working Group Contending Modernities, which is spending four years exploring how Catholicism, Islam, and secular liberalism uh, can productively interact in the public sphere with regard to difficult issues related to science and bioethics. Uh, and particularly in two of his four books, first, Peter Singer and Christian Ethics, Beyond Polarization, where he dialogues, as a Catholic, with the radical utilitarian philosopher Peter Singer, um, and in his most recent book, Beyond the Abortion Wars, A Way Forward for a New Generation, uh, some of which we will hear from today, I think. Uh, he has also written significant works on the treatment of critically ill newborns uh, in the neonatal intensive care unit and on the moral status and treatment of non-human animals. Finally, I was delighted to uh, finally meet in person this afternoon, uh, Rebecca Bratton-Weiss. Uh, Ms. Weiss wears a variety of hats. 
She is uh, a co-founder of the New Pro-Life Movement, which tries afresh to connect abortion uh, to other life issues, um, bridging the pro-life social justice divide, um, following in the footsteps of Cardinal Bernadine's seamless garment and Cardinal Supich's new articulation of the consistent ethic of solidarity. But as many of you know, when one tries to cross ideological lines, one can get caught in the culture war crossfire, um, as Drs. Rubio, uh, Camosi, and I also know well. Uh, when she's not ducking socio-political bullets, she lectures in English literature and occasionally philosophy. She argues politics uh, and the arts uh, in the journal Convivium and on the blog Patheos, which focuses on religion, culture, and politics. She also writes poems, homeschools her children, which is one of the Christian family practices about which Julie Rubio has written. Uh, she raises ponies, uh, and what makes me quite jealous, she has time to do some serious gardening. Uh, and I learned at lunch she's writing a feminist dystopian novel about sex robots. So just take note of that. Uh, so those are our panelists. Uh, as you can see, there are many points of intersection uh, between the viewpoints that they bring, but uh, I trust that we will also find that there are equally points of divergence and disagreement, which I hope will make our time together lively and informative. Um, today, they'll be discussing, as we heard, the legacy of Humana Vitae, not necessarily Humana Vitae itself, the legacy of Humana Vitae and what it means to be pro-life. We are approaching the 50th anniversary of the issuing of that papal encyclical by the recently canonized St. Paul VI, uh, an encyclical that might be characterized as either divisive or a watershed, depending on which side of polarity you fall on. 50 years seems like a lifetime, especially to Mike Murphy. Um, but as I have often said, uh, 50 years is approximately two weeks in the life of the church. Right? So in many ways, Humanae Vitae is a very new document. Uh, today, we're going to focus not so much on the document, but on its legacy uh, and what it means to be pro-life now and perhaps for the next 50 years. We are going to open with Dr. Rubio, followed by Dr. Camosi, followed by Ms. Weiss. Uh, then we will, uh, they'll spend each about 15 minutes giving some remarks. Um, they will engage for about 15 minutes, um, a little collegial sparring always wakes people up in the late afternoon. Uh, uh, you might surmise, because you're at these round tables, that we will then have about 20 minutes for table conversation, um, and then we will return to the large group to hear your thoughts. So, with that, Welcome, Dr. Julie Hanlon Rubio. Thanks. So I grew up in a home in which the thought of talking about the legacy of Humanae Vitae might have been met with a certain amount of laughter, right? A community as well where that document did not enjoy a lot of um, respect. Um, and I know as a theologian, I can point to parts of that document that enjoy pretty broad respect. You might be able to get agreement even among Catholic theologians who are pretty divided on this document, um, that Humanae Vitae can, can be celebrated for its integration of personalist language to talk about sexuality, something we didn't have much of before. So phrases like reciprocal personal gift of self appear in the document. And there are also some prophetic words about the call of the church to be a sign of contradiction in the world that to various extents people on both sides might claim. And yet, in reality, when I think about what is the legacy of Humanae Vitae, it seems to me that division is dominant. It's not an even division, 
that is the percentage of Catholics who, um, who find Humanae Vitae to be prophetic in its major teaching versus the percentage that don't is, is very unbalanced and that holds whether you're talking about all Catholics or Catholics in the US um, or even mass going, regular mass going Catholics. But those of us who work in the circles of Catholicism of the church know that those percentages look a little different when you're in the inside and that those divides in fact are really serious. They're serious in universities, in departments of theology, in campus ministries, in parishes, in seminaries, and of course in the Catholic blogosphere. And I'm not sure, frankly, that the document itself provides a way beyond that division. But I want to suggest that if division is the legacy of Humanae Vitae, dialogue and in the service of some progress on issues that are important to the pro-life movement could be the legacy of Humanae Vitae. If we focus on the process that preceded the document. Right? What's so wonderful about the process? Many in the room might be familiar, some may not be. It was an important thing that Paul VI, St. Paul VI did in appointing a birth control commission to study the issue that was becoming increasingly controversial in the 1960s. It was co increasingly controversial culturally as well as theologically. And so he appointed this commission that had a three-year mandate to study and talk about the issue. It was originally small. It originally included only men and only scholars, but was later brought into about 60 people, including four women, including lay people, right? And they studied the question. And Chicagoans, Pat and Patty Crowley, the leaders of the Christian family movement, had a really important role in that commission. And they brought to the commission, after some frustrating conversations, studies of couples who were using the rhythm method at the time. First, they were informal. Later, they extended to 18 countries, really systematic good studies in which they asked couples, what's going on in your lives with this method? And they found out that there was a lot of suffering that was related to the rhythm method. And at one point, Patty Crowley recounts, the theologians and scientists asked the four women present to speak from their experience, and they did. And they spoke movingly about the psychological effects of the rhythm method, about their view that it didn't foster married love or unity, and their belief that it felt profoundly unnatural. I can imagine what was going on in the room at that time where the theologians and the science scientists who were used to one sort of conversation were open to this other sort of conversation coming from the laity, coming from experience. And it moved. Right? It moved the group. It moved the condition the commission in a certain condition, in a certain direction. Now we know um, that Paul VI didn't follow the direction of the commission, but I'm leaving that aside for today. <laughs> and I'd like to suggest though with abortion, particularly, we are in a similar situation in which there's all kinds of cultural conversation and theological conversation going on, not so much about the morality of abortion itself, which I will also leave to the side. Or I'll take, I'll, I'll take, um, take as given. But about how to be pro-life, about what it means to try to, to work on this problem. The movement, I would argue, is marginalized and it's lacking attention from people who should be its best allies, but can't get on board with a movement that seems so unprogressive in so many ways. So as someone who owns the pro-life label, I want that to change. Right? And so I want to look to the process that preceded Humanae Vitae for some help, something that might inform our approach to being pro-life today. What might that look like? 
I think it has three parts that I'll talk about very briefly. One is we have to dialogue with feminists in particular who are making serious arguments about bodily integrity. Second, we need to listen to people on both sides who have information on us as to why women turn to abortion. And third, we need to think creatively about how to work together across these lines to reduce abortion. So first, a dialogue with feminists. This is something that I actually think that the process of Humanity Day did not do very well. There were women on the commission, but when you think about uh, 1968 being kind of the epicenter of second wave feminism, there actually wasn't a whole lot of dialogue with feminists then. Right? Today, there's not so much dialogue either. It is really powerful for people to hear arguments from feminists about the, the right of women to control their bodies especially in the context of knowing how many rights that women have lacked historically, the right to say no to sex, even from their husbands, right? the right to contraception, the right to enter professions, the right to vote, the right, we could go on and on and on. In that context, the idea of denying women right over this profoundly personal decision seems really, really unthinkable. Pro-life Move, the pro-life movement has to respond to that. A friend recently sent me an article that's going making the rounds on the blogosphere written by a Catholic doctor who shared her own story of having to have an abortion over a very, when a, uh, her unborn child was very sick. Um, she also had a story of, of caring for patients over, over the years and understanding their decisions to have abortions. And she talked about attending to a dying woman uh, who came into the, her emergency room uh, after a botched abortion attempt. And she concludes, women are making the best choices they can in really difficult situations and we simply have to trust them. Right? The hashtag, trust women. Right? If those who are pro-life can't quite go that far, okay, at the very least, we have to be able to say that this is a heart-wrenching and difficult problem, different than saying no to the death penalty, right? no to other, pro, other life issues. There's something unique about this problem. And our approach has to be informed by, by feeling the heart-wrenchingness of this problem. Second, we have to listen to both sides on why women get abortion. I find uh, really striking that those who work for the Guttmacher Institute, run by Planned Parenthood, have put out a ton of information about this topic, as well as those who work in crisis pregnancy centers, which are, which are uh, run by people who are pro-life, generally, have actually very similar narratives of why women get abortions. They spin them a little bit differently, but the information is actually strikingly the same. It focuses on relationships, finances, and instability. So for the Guttmacher Institute, they talk about how women talk about their, their responsibilities to other people, their relational responsibilities. And it's out of their responsibilities to parents, to, to existing children, to others, that they find themselves unable to carry out this, this particular pregnancy. They're afraid, they have financial concerns, they're afraid about interference with work or school, they don't have a supportive partner. Right? So in the face of that, the gut microinstitute says they make a tragic but responsible choice. From the crisis pregnancy centers, who also deal with pregnant women coming to them, thinking, and also women who've had abortions afterwards, they argue, yes, that's true, but there's also a measure of pressure that comes from these relationships, pressure from spouses, pressure from parents, right? So it's not that women are weighing all their options sort of neutrally and saying, this is my only, this is the only way I can do it. There's, there's also, some coercion involved in that of various levels. 
And so it's not a totally free choice, but rather a really tragic choice. Both of them tell us that these are complicated decisions. They can't just be solved by economic and social help because they're profoundly complicated relationally. That's helpful. So it's not simply poverty, although poverty is a factor. It's not simply personal unreadiness or relationship issues, but it's all of those things together that make this choice so very difficult. That helps us to see that popular solutions like simply provide contraception or adoption or health and social services in and of themselves won't get us anywhere near far enough in solving these problems because they're deeply personal, cultural, social, local. Right? Also helpful to know, I find this really not often addressed in public debates on this issue, is that the very women in our society who are bringing uh, babies to term outside of marriage, and it's 40% now, right, are often facing the very same circumstances that women who do end up getting abortions face. That is, they are outside of marriage, they're often not financially well set up, there are often relational problems, but sociologists who study, especially poor African-American and Latino women who tend to have a disproportionate number of births outside of marriage, tell us that these women often do make the choice to have a baby anyway, and often they see that as a choice of hope, a choice of, of wanting a better life, a choice that they don't want to give up. Okay? That's interesting. So women with more economic stability and more, um, and more choices, more to lose, tend to not either have the abortions or have the babies. They tend to use contraception or be careful, right? But many of the same women are making these, these, these different choices, which tells us also perhaps there are, there are possibilities there that we may not always see when we just focus on the tragedy of the situations. So knowing what's at stake here helps us know what has to be done. So then what, what might we do? I think if we can bracket the political issues, Frank Charlie will disagree with me on this one, but that'll be good. Uh, if we can bracket them for a moment and focus on what, what can be done at the local level, we might be able to bring folks from the liberal side and the conservative side, folks who see themselves as more pro-life and pro see themselves more pro-choice, and about 40% who say, yeah, both, both pro-life and pro-choice. We can bring them together to talk about what might be possible at the local level. It's there that we can think about what would adequate support be like for a woman who's facing this complex set of questions. What would it look like? It might look less like a social program and more like a community. It might look more like a parish that would truly be a place where people could bring tragic problems and find support, not just economic support, not just baby clothes, not just housing, but actually a network of communities and a network of friends. The most important thing that women say when they uh, talk about why they, why, what, what they need is they need support, personal support. And that's the kind of thing that we can do in the local space that can't be done from above. So in conclusion, I think with deep listening and openness to new thinking, a pro-life movement can move past what is currently division and draw on the legacy of humanity to the legacy of the, of the process, of the listening, and move toward not maybe what, what we might hope, what ultimately hope for, but at least to more progress than we're currently able to make.